It's my pleasure to introduce the next panel um, for discussion, which is going to be moderated by Robin um, and includes Bunim from uh, Swimply, Dane Atkinson from Odeco, Erica Wool from Stripe, Neil Delal from uh, JP Morgan, and Will Pang from Northstar. Um, we're going to be diving in a little bit more on the macro environment and getting the consumer, SMB, and enterprise perspectives on the prospect of an economic slowdown. So, please. Thank you, Marcello. So, um, this panel is really interesting, and I've been wanting to, to put this together because we have a panel of like people who touch the consumer, people who touch enterprise, who touch SMBs all in one place. And so, um, wanted to hear everyone's various um, perspectives here. But I'll first um, have you all briefly introduce yourselves um, and who, like, who do you work for and who do you service um, for, at your company? So, Dane. Sure. Uh, I'm Dane, for those who have not met me. I've applied for the fan club president of GGV for a while now. <laughs> Get to win it. Uh, and we are as deeply embedded as you can be in the SME. It's my life trying to help them. Today, we help coffee shops make their days work better. We load them up in the middle of the night. 1,200 shops in New York are mysteriously loaded like us by ferries. Um, it's a great mission to be. We've got a good leadership team, so I'll be here with you and talk yeah. about it. Yeah. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name's Erica. I lead one of the partnerships teams at Stripe. Um, and so I think Stripe is kind of best known for serving SMBs and startups, but we actually serve businesses across the spectrum from the SMB to the enterprise. So uh, looking forward today to talking a little bit about what that breadth of businesses is seeing as we enter this period of uncertainty. Hi, everyone. My name is Will Peng. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Northstar. Uh, we are a personal financial advising company. So what that means is that we partner with employers uh, to provide one-on-one -on -one access to financial planners and financial management tools. Um, our mission is to create financial well-being for the 100%. And our customers have a wide range of industries, um, but some that you might recognize are Workday, Zoom, Snap, and Service Titan. Hey everyone, I'm Neil. I'm Managing Director at JP Morgan in our Tech IB Group. And I help consumer-facing and SMB-facing tech companies grow through IPOs, M&A, debt financings, and private financings, and many GGV companies. Hey everyone, my name is Bunim Laskin. I am the founder and CEO of Swimply. It's an online marketplace that essentially allows homeowners to share their creative spaces with their neighborhood and their community. We, by default, like create almost SMBs from regular uh, moms at home. And uh, we are, 70% sort of, of our users are families, um, but we're uh, expanding right now into more verticals outside of swimming pools, um, is including tennis, pickleball, and hoops, a lot of trendy um, dynamics that are happening across this uh, Dynamic, so excited to talk about it. So much that can overlap here, where Eric can come power giving you your transactions, Dane can bring the coffee, and Will can like service all the SME owners and their financial wellness. Exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think this will be a round robin type of question. Has the prospect of a recession already begun to actually affect any of your respective businesses? And feel free to chime in in any order. Oh, well, I'd say we have a lot of coffee shops, 10,000 or so, and they, in the indie space, haven't felt the inflation impact yet. Their sales have oddly patterned really to 2019, which is somewhat surprising. So that's returned to the behavior from vacation and travel and workforces that we've seen there. Um, they don't have any idea sort of what's mm -hmm. coming, which is super sad because they're so in the weeds. And we as a company are just doing everything we can to make sure we're here to support them and kind of focus on their longevity. But it's a... Uh, we perceive optimistically that there's going to be a coming out of this that's super strong, but those shops are going to be facing some challenging times. Typically, they don't go down as much as restaurants do, but yeah, the whole space gets pushed. I think that we see things like fairly similarly. Stripe is lucky that the trajectory of our business is probably more like the internet economy. When the overall economy is going well, it's probably growing a little faster. When you see a slowdown, we're still growing, but, but not as fast as before. But we serve all of these businesses of all sizes. And what we see is our sort of um, focus right now is how we help them. And so we actually are thinking about changes that we can make to our product roadmap um, to help businesses better sort of run more efficiently. So we have a suite of revenue and financial management product, products. Um, that's a big focus area right now. We're thinking about what we need to accelerate for 2023 to help people automate things that used to be manual, close their books faster, et cetera. Um, products that help people optimize their revenue, which right now means 
like retaining every single dollar. Um, and so there are a lot of different ways that we can actually drive more focus in our business on that. Um, and then the last area is just adapt more quickly. Like I think that at least collectively, it feels like we are moving through this and there's still uncertainty about the specific direction that it will take or sort of the things that may happen along the way. And so we have to help businesses be really flexible. And so this is where having sort of an API first approach is really, really helpful, especially for businesses that can code, but we serve a lot of SMBs and that means we also need to offer low or no code products. And so we're investing more in that. Yeah, what we've found is that financial well-being and financial advising is counter-cyclical. Uh, financial questions are important both in good times, but especially critical during tough times like we are today. Um, and what we've seen is that, I mean, as you know, our customers are employers. And uh, we've seen a refocus on uh, initiatives that support uh, our people, our employees foundationally, uh, rather than those things that are frivolous. Uh, and our people are our biggest investment. Uh, and uh, it's not enough anymore just to pay them a salary and give them benefits and hope that they know what to do. I think there's an unreasonable expectation uh, of, of, that's placed on the shoulders of employees as, and by extension the employers to know exactly how to make the most of what we get and what we give our, our people. Um, and the default state currently, you look at all the metrics around personal financials, financial well-being and financial health, it's all going in the wrong direction. Uh, my father will, grad, will, will, will retire at some point soon and uh, he'll, he'll get pension payments, but we now live in a world where uh, we have all these choices that we need to make. So um, I think there needs to be a, a new model for uh, uh, compensation as well as uh, for how we think about human capital as, as not only uh, our most important investment, um, but also in many cases our largest investment. Um, so what we've seen is that across pretty much all of our metrics uh, of demand, uh, a significant increase in, in uh, uh, what uh, we are doing and what we're offering. Um, and, and from an operational perspective, uh, I think the, 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 what you've seen commonly uh, in, in writing today is, is all about cutting costs. Um, but we, we think about it um, as uh, focusing on the fundamentals. Um, so what are the core parts of a business that uh, 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 will enable us to succeed not only today, but uh, to grow even more quickly uh, once we uh, come out of this and, and kind of accelerate into the curve? Uh, so, so that's what we're seeing both on the uh, customer side as well as our operational side. Great. Well, I work in the market, so very direct and quantifiable <laughs> uh, experience we've had this year. So. Last year, we had across, in the US a little over 300 IPOs. This year, year to date, 16. Uh, last year, of those 300, over half were tech, an all time record. This year, two are tech. And so the balance of those this year have been healthcare, financials, utility type companies, energy, things that are steadier across uh, any economic cycle. On the private side, we are seeing much more focus on downside protection. So things like liquidation preferences, preferred dividend, minimum return thresholds, all things that were- all the founders are cringing. <laughs> I know. And all things that were, as you guys know, exceptions to the rule last year are now, this year, the exception is clean rounds. And so we'll talk a little bit later, I think, Robin, on where it's going next year, but that's what we're seeing so far this year. Um, I would say like on our end, what makes Swimply very unique is that it's a brand new consumer behavior. And so we're kind of seeing it more from the real time over the last two, three years around you know, brand new consumer behaviors even in the regular world and how that morphs over with Swimply. Um, what has been quite fascinating for us to view is how sensitive and social this marketplace is. It's pretty much people from the same community opening up their backyards and sharing it locally. And that dynamic has actually proven to be quite beautiful over the last two years as we've seen local trends really just being accelerated with the pandemic and a lot of people looking for alternative ways um, to behave that are more intelligent and for people that actually seen things in the past that are now just meaningfully overrated. Um, and so what, what we've seen in the last two years is obviously a lot of people spending their money locally, looking for alternatives to ownership. Um, and it's time like these where companies like Swimply are born. Uh, the, the, similarity, the similar companies would be or mainly brought to life in 2008. And we're kind of seeing that right now with what we've, what Swimply, when Swimply essentially started, it was the idea was have your space pay for itself. But in the last two years, we've seen owners earn over 100K a year just from like opening up their backyard to the community. So both on the supply side, um, we're expecting that to be like, that to prove pretty powerful again with people looking for alternative ways to make an income and where you'll see a lot of people become entrepreneurs um, more than ever. And on the demand side, what Swimply 
How it simply manifests right now is it's more, it's more local, frequent, affordable vacation for a lot of moms at home that need that escape. It also manifests itself in an alternative to more expensive venues. And so you're, seeing, you're gonna see a lot of those dynamics, like I think get even more powerful um, during a recession. Um, but more than anything, I think you're gonna see like the idea of alternative ownership um, become exceptionally meaningful as we expand into other verticals. And so I do think a time like this is amazing for um, a brand like ours. When it comes down to operationally, it's my first time navigating essentially like uh, this kind of world. And uh, even when even the adults are freaking out, you know, then the, you know, <laughs> the, you know, you're definitely got to take a couple of steps uh, in the right direction. So definitely got to be more disciplined. I myself am actually enjoying a lot of the um, what you know investors are servicing now more than ever, as opposed to a lot of like I think the um, meritless growth, um, kind of focusing on uh, the more beautiful parts of building a business. And so I'm enjoying that at least it's happening now, and I don't have to change a lot of my behaviors. Um, to focus on these things. So, yeah, exciting but unpredictable times. So, um, so Atintia earlier was talking about uh, a lot of like the corporate balance sheets are well padded and so are profits still. And so, Will, what are like with the employers that you're working with, what are some of the important financial questions that they're asking? Um, and that is top of mind for them and how they shape what, what products to give their employees. Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, it, what we're finding is that uh, employees of all ranges of incomes and backgrounds um, are facing financial challenges. Uh, and uh, I think that's incredibly important to note. Uh, that this, is, this is not just something that uh, one particular demographic is facing. Uh, so it's important that when we work with, uh, employers have found that it's important to work with uh, a partner that supports all of their employees. Um, just some statistics that reflect this. Um, uh, the num this number keeps going up, unfortunately, but the latest that we saw is that 42% of high earners, so making over $100,000, are now living paycheck to paycheck. So, I mean, let that sink in for a second. We know all about the uh, numbers around inflation and consumer prices, but these, this metric actually strikes at the heart of uh, the, the, the actual impact on people's finances. Uh, I grew up uh, thinking that if I got a six-figure salary, then I'd have made it. Uh, but in this case, in, the, it's in these, these, these days, um, it's no longer enough, especially if you're supporting an entire family. Uh, so the, the second one is that uh, about a third of uh, employees now need to, to delay their retirement. Uh, and, and so again, the, the, the systems that are in place um, are no longer enough as a default state uh, for our people to be financially healthy. Um, the, the types of problems that people are facing um, that we see most frequently uh, these days range from cash flow challenges uh, to uh, long-term investing um, and, and kind of proactive opportunities, uh, as well as uh, questions related to your compensation. So with, related to, with regards to cash flow, of course, like how do I make my ends meet when uh, the cost of groceries has gone up or uh, the cost of gas has gone up significantly? Uh, or maybe I, I had an unexpected emergency expense. How do I cover the costs? Um, and what is the impact on not only my short-term goals, preventing myself from going into a debt spiral, uh, as well as long-term goals, what is the impact on my retirement? And, and uh, uh, maybe my, my partner or spouse has been laid off. Um, what impact does that have on, on our family? Um, from, a, from an investment perspective, um, of course, what happens if you need to delay retirement? Um, and is it the right time to invest? Um, people are trying to time the markets now. And is it, have we reached the bottom yet? Well, we don't know. Um, but, uh, uh, and then finally, uh, the, why it's so important that we're working with employers is that um, equity compensation, um, uh, such a significant part of so many different companies' total compensation packages, in some cases as high as 30 to 50% of the total comp, uh, we've seen them drop in some cases 50 to 75%. Uh, so how should employees be thinking about equity compensation? How can we equip, equip employers to have these conversations with their employees in a uh, 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 regulated way, uh, uh, as well as a uh, empathetic way? Um, mm -hmm. It, that's, that's a really difficult um, challenge to, to answer right now. And, and, and how do you create a, a framework of, of thinking about uh, the range of possibilities of equity compensation? And I think, I think these sets of challenges are obviously a subset of all the challenges that people are facing. But I think the reality that we're seeing is that uh, financial health is an employer problem now because if 
uh, they don't support uh, their employees, uh, and I should say we, as in I'm an employer as well, don't support our employees' financial well-being. Uh, they feel like they don't have the support uh, around their, these acute challenges they're facing, as well as uh, supporting the long-term goals. Um, then they're going to be less productive at work, um, and they're also more likely to look elsewhere uh, to solve these financial challenges. Um, so, so this has become a, a core need um, as part of the uh, kind of employer and employee experience stack. Uh, that we're seeing. The stats that you shared are so alarming because it's not something that like, you know, we, I, I feel like we don't think about day to day, but it is affecting all of our like day to day lives because we all buy groceries and we all kind of, um, you know, s s you know, are used to spending a certain way, but now that dollar is taking us a little less further than it used to. And so it's, it's very funny. I purposely put this panel together because I wanted to hear all these perspectives. And like, Bunham, you seem to have a different perspective of what you're seeing on the ground, because while we hear those stats from Will and also like Dean, like, are you seeing any of the like the slowdown in people doing leisure activities and spending on pools? Because when you're booking on Swimply as a platform, you're booking like by the hour. And so people are paying to like, you know, have fun at the pool with their family. Yeah, I mean, I would say August, um, we definitely saw a lot of like sensitivity around not necessarily people wanting to go, but what they were willing to spend. Um, and so, and ironically, owners actually increasing the prices at the worst possible time. Uh, so, uh, so it definitely, like, because it's a brand new marketplace and everybody is ultimately rookies at it, uh, you had a lot of the savvy homeowners that leaned into it, actually. And like, hey, there's going to be a whole ton of demand for actually mo even more affordable experiences, even relatively to Swimply. And so kind of leaning into it and actually really rising up in August. But owners are staying, like, stagnant, like, ultimately, and just not really reacting, really not getting the same, not experiencing the same earnings that they were on, on August. So like we definitely have a bit of a, like a marketplace shift and it's cool to see it happen with owners raising their prices because of inflation and people wanting to spend less. Yeah. And as a marketplace, it kind of takes time for things to even itself out. Yeah. Um, but that's been like the most, um, I guess like that's, that's been the thing that's made it the most cognizant. So um, what are you doing to kind of like prevent that to keep happening in the future, right? Yeah, so pricing in general is so complicated because like, what do you price for this? It's like, as I mentioned, it's a brand new consumer behavior. So there aren't really existing ecosystems to imitate. Um, and so most of what our team has been focusing on, like in, the, in these last few months has been like pricing recommendations, education, webinars, things that educate these owners who are like, a lot of them are seeing this like starting their first business. And so we've been already kind of a little bit ahead of the curve in the sense where we've been we needed to educate this marketplace in the first place. Now it is getting more aggressive and more of a bigger focus for us to like make owners be more adaptive to the market as well as giving them a lot of tools to be able to navigate it so they can see the data that we're seeing in real time as yeah. opposed to like us manually needing to coach them through this. Um, so building a lot of things for scale, building, getting a lot of data just pumped through the, to these hosts so they can make good decisions. Yeah. Um, Dane. <laughs> yeah. Very similar to Bunham, right? Like you touch the end consumer, but you also touch the business owner. And so um, you alluded to earlier that like consumer demand hasn't really softened, but like how how are how are the owners being affected if at all? Because they're buying everything through the Odeco platform too, in terms of like the milks, the coffee, yep. the cups, Sarah. I mean, we're we're fortunate because our model lowers the cost for our shops, so they're getting a little bit of extra buffer and they're able to endure it. And the inflation that we've seen on the goods is actually in our space about 12, 15 percent, but it's lifted up in the grocery space 30 plus percent wow. as people have tried to adjust. Our shops similarly are really poor at making price adjustments because they they are trying to take it on their chin and they don't want to hurt their own community, so they tend to absorb some of that price inflation. Um, but just to put some positivity in here, because. <laughs> We're emotional down here. Uh, we, two and a half years ago, saw all these shops in New York closed. We walked down these streets and there was not a single place that was open. Small business fights. They came back, they reopened, they started selling eggs, we started providing other products. They, I, I think that we often forget how strong the community really is and their ability to adjust. And they may not be on the pattern as fast as we are here lucky enough to see the future, but with a little bit of guidance, a little bit of help, they will tend to find ways to bring that economy back into their shops. And we already started to see that. We're starting to see a few of the customers that we have starting to bring in the SKUs that they were pushing in COVID to try to make things work, coming back into their shops today as they're trying to make sure they're answering more customer demand and selling food and eggs and other things to make them really work. Um, they're such a lovely, resilient category, and they're not going anywhere. 
So as a seasoned operator or the adult <laughs> here, um, really great here. <laughs> uh, like you've gone through some of the cycles, like what are some lessons that are kind of like investors or um, entrepreneurs can take away? Uh, so being old um, and having gone through this before, uh, well, I started really young as a teenager in my first company, so you know, like it's a cycle the times. Um, this feels really close to what 2001 felt like. Uh, being in New York and having built a company at that time, uh, the venture market all froze and got panicked, and no one knew where the markdowns were, and companies that were incredibly humble and aggressive in saying that we want to be here for our customers and making the right price adjustments and their valuations and trying to find partnerships tend to survive these kind of arcs vastly better. I think the same thing for the partnerships that we have with amazing funds, sort of having those open discussions and making sure that you're talking about the things that you're seeing on your side and helping the companies kind of stabilize through it. There is a lot of team support that's necessary because all of our teams are basically compressed with inflation and equity declines. So trying to make sure that everyone there and rifts that we all are having to do, like that they're bullied up to seeing the future as well are keystones. On the bright side, those are companies that make it through stand alone. You make incredibly good companies during these time cycles. They're very efficient. They tend to make money. It's, it's a, it is an awesome time to build in, but you have to take uh, awareness of what's actually happening and ingest that into your system as fast as you can. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of partnerships, maybe I'll, <laughs> I'll ask Erica this question because partnerships is top of mind for so many of our portfolio. And we'll get through a lot of this particularly later in another panel, because it is a different way to kind of access uh, and bring down your CAC, right, as a founder. And so can you give a few examples of like the partnership you've done at Stripe and like, and also in your past? Sure. And to be fair, you did ask me to explain what I did when I started and I just talked about Stripe and who we serve. So maybe I'll go back to that. Okay. Um, so if you think about Stripe as, and uh, I don't, won't assume a lot of familiarity, but maybe some of you have heard the tagline that we build economic infrastructure for the internet. Um, but what we actually build is a bunch of APIs. We do build infrastructure. What makes that economic infrastructure is the literally thousands of partnerships that we have around the world that actually connect that with um, you know all of the other businesses that you need to move money to do all sorts of things that relate to payments and our other sort of core businesses. And so um, I focus on those. I help Stripe build and launch and scale new products that rely on these third parties. And so I'll give you two really quick examples. And I think both of them are kind of relevant to the environment that we're in today. Um, first is around payment methods. So, I mean, we're sitting here in New York City in the U.S. Most of you use cards. Um, outside of the U.S., people don't prefer to pay with cards. And so this is something that um, we saw a great acceleration of um, during the pandemic, but it's a trend that's continuing, which is that businesses are going sort of global by default. You know, back in 2020 and through 2021, um, when everybody was shifting online, they were trying to find buyers wherever they could. And so that meant that you now had a willingness to sell cross-border and you had no idea what people in these other markets wanted to pay with. And so that's where, you know, sort of what we're doing at Stripe and really focusing on building out this network of payment methods, whether it's um, Alipay or WeChat or the buy now, pay later craze that sort of is finally sweeping the U.S., but was a really popular sort of form of payment um, elsewhere. Like those, that's sort of the network of payment methods that we're trying to build. And our goal is really to ensure that like all of the businesses that are running on Stripe can connect with the people that they want to sell to, that they want to do business with. Um, so that's one area that I focus a lot on. Um, and then the other, and this is uh, today more relevant for, for the U.S. market, but something we're doing globally as well, is for in-person commerce. Now that it's coming back, um, one of the big partnerships that our team worked on this year was actually with Apple um, for what they call tap to pay on iPhone, which is really about making uh, the iPhone a payment terminal. Um, this capability has existed on Android for a bit, but by extending this to iOS, we've been able to help more businesses start selling in person faster. Um, and so some of the sort of success cases for us today are like the barbershops that um, now can help people um, not just take cash, but reach more, um, reach more clients because they can accept card payments. Turns out it's also easier to close your books that way, but um, <laughs> a side benefit. Um, but it's also really helping, um, you know, think about Shopify, which is one of Stripe's major partners. All of the SMBs that um, during the pandemic became or became interested in, in selling in person at a farmer's market or pop-up shops 
Um, now they can do it without having to invest in additional hardware. Um, so that's something that I think has really helped us accelerate, as I was talking about before, the ways to help different types of businesses. Um, and I think that what we expect to see is more types of businesses that we never expected to use that form factor and coming out of sort of this uh, kind of moment that we're in, you know, net new use cases and that type of thing, um, and really sort of hopefully some evolution in interesting ways of commerce. Um, can you talk about like how the, you know, inflationary environment and um, recession has affected the way you guys make partnerships or even prioritize them? Yeah, so I think that, you know, for us, um, we are laser focused on if there are ways that we can create more partnerships that help our users, the businesses that are built on Stripe, um, shift CapEx to OpEx. And so um, some of that is, um, you know, the it gives us sort of like a new lens for selecting a partner. It's not necessarily just about a capability, but we sort of look at things and we say, Previously, you would have sort of wanted to bring this totally in-house, um, but now you really don't want that cost in your books or you're not sure that this is the right thing to invest in. So you want to you know, have some sort of channel for trying before you decide to go sort of fully into that area. And so I think that that has definitely shaped how we think about it. From an external partner perspective, um, I would say that um, we have more and more partners coming to us um, looking for ways that they can, you mentioned CAC before, but um, if you can work sort of one to many by striking a partnership with someone like Stripe or another company that I think does this, I mean, there are a lot of companies in the payment space, I think that do this really, really well. Um, I'll call it Shopify again, because I think they've, they've been like excellent at that. Um, but they, you know, when we can work with an external company and actually give them distribution among Stripe's users, um, it's sort of as close to a win-win-win as we're gonna get. Um, because we've helped the partner lower their costs of reaching new businesses. We've helped our businesses um, get access to more choices, potentially, um, you know, uh, things that help them, um, whether it's operate more efficiently or kind of um, expand to, uh, into new business areas. Um, and then because a lot of the um, partnerships that we're building also show up for the end consumer, um, if it's a payment method, um, we're benefiting kind of like that end consumer as well. So... I think that's that's what we're seeing right now. Cool. Um, Neil, going back to you, uh, and I think we're all curious about this outlook of the tech IPO market um, over the next year. And like, when do you expect there be any type of like recovery that we can see? Yeah. So let's just start with putting yourselves in the shoes of an IPO investor. So if you're an IPO investor, you have to meet a company and based on very limited, curated, and regulated financial information in an S1, plus at best one one-on-one -on -one meeting, make an investment decision over the course of two weeks and allocate either tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars to invest in a company, and the scoreboard starts as soon as the company starts trading. So you'll know right away if it's going up or down and you start to get judged on that. That is a pretty hard job in a, in a very certain macro backdrop. It's an even tougher job in an uncertain macro backdrop. So, you know, last week I was talking to a, uh, a PM at a large mutual fund, and what she said is, you know, I can't even underwrite the next two quarters, let alone the next two years. So how can I invest in, in a pre-IPO company? Um, so if I, if I take that one step further, the way we're looking at it is we're really focused on Q2 2023. And that's for mm -hmm. two reasons. One is, if you think about Q1 2023, that's lapping obviously Q1 2022. Well, in Q1 2022, we had the Omicron surge, as well as we had the still prevalent presence of, cons of consumer stimulus. So for digital e-commerce sort of businesses and any sort of even SMB focused digital businesses, two pretty incredible tailwinds. And there's a lot of questions around how those two tailwinds will unwind and what that means for Q1 performance. So that's point one. The second point is obviously what everyone's talking about, which is the Fed fund rate. Most folks think that by March, April next year, we should have a sense of where funds rate is going. It could go to 4.5%, 5%, 6%, Who knows the actual metric? But what's more important is certainty as to what the distribution of outcomes is. So if by March, April next year, you have certainty on distribution of outcomes on interest rates, plus you have some evidence of year-over-year -year trends in spending and, and how uh, digital-facing businesses are impacted, then for us, we're planning for Q2 as the first real window that we're guiding our clients towards. Wow. 
I feel I feel lucky to be a VC investor. Then, um, I guess like what I so in preparation for that, what should mid stage mid stage and late stage tech companies be doing today to best position themselves for next year and for the future after that? Yeah. So both 2023, 2024, 2025. Mm-hmm. Um, so really three things we think about. And one is a point that Chintio was making earlier, which is around forecasting. Imagine being a public company right now and having to tell the market, we think in Q4 we'll do this much and in Q1 next year we'll do this much. And being judged against that you know, across not only public market investors, but employees, partners, customers, everyone sees it. So building that discipline now internally, not only with your C-suite and with your board, but with one level below the C-suite in terms of how your whole company thinks about next quarter goals, next year goals, and having the discipline internally of saying, let's mark ourselves to market internally. You can do a mock earnings call, for example, with all your employees, so everyone knows how do we perform this quarter and how did that do versus what we thought we were gonna do. And based on that, what can we do better to forecast the next quarter? Because one day, whenever you guys decide to go public, you'll have to do that. So that's point one. Point two is around balance sheet and liquidity. Um, and you know, one of the things I was referencing earlier is that Private rounds are getting much tougher to do. Uh, And so as a result, a lot of companies are relying on either inside rounds or debt providers. And it's important to mark yourself to market almost every month on both those regards. So you may thought, you know, in August, your board told you we're good for X amount or a debt partner or debt financing partner said, you know, we'll always be good for 20 million, 30 million, whatever it is. That may change. Like I know at JP Morgan, our underwriting standards have changed dramatically from August till today. And from today till January, it'll probably change again dramatically. And so constantly marking yourself to market mm-hmm. so you know what's really available to you in the event something goes wrong. Um, and then thirdly, most IPO investors now want to meet the next IPO, uh, next prospective IPO three times before the actual IPO. So what we're doing right now for a lot of our class of 2024 IPOs, they're doing their first real meetings with IPO investors right now. Wow. And their second ones will be next summer and their third ones will be towards the end of 2023, early 24. That enables them to build a rapport with the IPO investor and remove some of the friction I described earlier, which is the the tough part in their job. But also by spacing out the interaction, you give yourself a chance to say, I'm gonna do X, Y, Z in the first meeting, then you go show him or her. And you can give them a real sense of, look, this is a company that has a good handle on their business, does what they say they're gonna do, and one I can trust in the public markets to really perform. So the three things I'd say. I guess like now that, you know, the valuations are coming back down to earth or becoming more realistic. And I know Ajintia had talked a little bit about that. We're also seeing both from like the board standpoint, but also um, I'm sure all of you have experienced like different 409A valuations. And so like, Will, how are your companies kind of, um, you know, Neil is talking about the IPO delay or like that window is not open until next year, like, and they're adjusting their own valuations. How are employers dealing with that and telling them they're how, selling their employees? Yeah, we've seen the entire range of responses from no response to proactive responses. Um, we've had some, we've had some clients, uh, employers, um, uh, proactively refresh employees' equity compensation, as an example, um, or to, to kind of match the dollar value of what they were originally granted. Um, and of course, uh, you, you've seen uh, examples of, say, Instacart, who proactively mm-hmm. um, adjusted their valuation down. Um, so, and also some of their investors. Right. <laughs> Who are these pre IPO investors? Happen? Right. Um, so, so I think. Uh, it's it's a it, you use the word uh, kind of adjustment and and, and uh, uh, I think it's it's um, not in anybody's best interest to um, uh, have a valuation that far outstrips uh, your ability to to meet those expectations. Um, so um, and and I think it, yeah you were saying it's 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 not just important for communication to your investors but also to your people as well. Um, I think as soon as you lose the trust of your employees um, in what you're saying and what you're guiding them, I think they start to question whether it's the right place for them. Um, so um, I, I think it's incredibly painful that every, what everybody's going through right now. But uh, at the end of the day, I think uh, it, it was it, it's, a, it's the right thing to, to do. Um, uh, and and uh, I think it'll be nice to get back to. Um, uh, plans that are more forecastable and deterministic rather than 
um, rather than uh, somewhat of a lottery. Uh, if you pick the right company and, and uh, the, the, you, you somehow catch the exact combination of um, macro factors rather than fundamentals. Um, so I, th I think it's overall it's healthy for, 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 the, for, the, um, for businesses, for, for um, the overall markets, um, but also for, for employees. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess, Erica, I want to ask you about like partnerships because, you know, Atintia was talking about U.S. being very strong, um, in a, at least from a position standpoint, but globally, you know, Stripe has business everywhere as well. And a lot of us also think about, um, do we, like, should we expand across the U.S.? Do we invest in those markets, right? I think Bundam is also thinking about it as well, like, should I test another market? Um, you've thought about it as well, in, like, potentially U.K. And so, um, um, or not now after what he said and so so like when you prioritize partnerships like how do you how do you think about that and like uh, and how do you prioritize at different geos yeah that, that's a it's a good question it's like a really complicated one too um, so for stripe when we think about expansion actually a partnership is typically um, the first thing we need to be able to operate in another market and the way that we make those decisions, um, especially over the last couple of years where there's just been so much sort of change in the way that people are conducting commerce or doing business, first because of the pandemic, now because of this, um, that, um, you know, it's a combination of things. So first and foremost, it's like, what do the businesses that you Stripe need? Um, and what a lot of the businesses, particularly now that we are more in the inter enterprise space, um, what they tell us is they do expect to be in more markets because they want sort of one provider that can take them into dozens of markets versus having to work with, you know, a, a combination of several different payments companies. Um, and so that's like one set of pressures. Um, but on the, the other side, um, for smaller businesses or sort of mid-sized businesses that are in fewer markets, a lot of them still want one provider, uh, but they want us to go much more deep and offer the full set of Stripe products in those markets. Whereas like with enterprise, like you need payments, you hopefully you use Stripe for more than that, but you're, you need us to have payments there. And so the trade-offs between those, we're often looking at um, not just making a decision about a single market, but a cluster of markets at once, right? So, um, you know, we're in 65 markets today um, and we probably won't expand to as many next year because now we need to build that product depth. Mm. Um, there may be some in the margins to hit those clusters. Um, so for instance, um, we launched in, uh, in the Middle East earlier this year for the, the first market where Stripe, um, uh, first time we launched in the Middle East, going to UAE. Um, and that was not necessarily because it was the largest market, but that is often where when you are trying to do business in the region, um, there are a smaller set of markets, that sort of cluster notion that I was talking about, that you need to have have the ability to, you know, to have a provider like Stripe in to be able to do business. Um, and we look at other regions like APAC or Latium um, in, a, in a similar way. What is the right combination of countries for us to be present in? And what do we need to offer? Is it depth? Is it just payments? Mm -hmm. I, I guess the same question around like market prioritization could be asked of Bunham and, and Dane as our last question because you guys are in the US, but you're in many different markets of the US and they're all, I think, very different from each other. If you could just like share some advice about how you're prioritizing and how you're thinking about expansion within market, whether it's like many more markets or more deeply per market would be helpful because you, you even have product expansion to, to think about. Yeah, um, I guess for us, it's getting much more intentional. Uh, so far, it's kind of expanded just based on like where the consumers took it. Um, what's cool about Swimpy is as an owner, you can sign up and you can really begin marketing locally, right? Mm -hmm. Make your own initiatives because your demand is your community. And so we've definitely, most of our expansion has been organic and kind of just following it around as we get much more intentional about how our business matures in these markets. Um, this is definitely definitely forcing us to like think um, a lot more about like the size of the markets, obviously, and how quickly we're going to reach profitability in um, a market. If, like you mentioned, um, a lot of these markets are just profoundly different than each other, and so at this point, we have enough data to suggest which markets are going to get profit are going to get profitability quicker, and that's kind of how we're focusing there. Um, we are like launching in Australia as well, so as long as you guys got our back covered there, we should be. Um, um, <laughs> 
oh, we should be fine. But that when that decision did come from deep internal like market research that we're usually not used to doing. Mm. Um, and it's definitely um, been a positive change um, for how we're thinking. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, thank God people like coffee. Uh, we are not expanding to any new markets. So for the board meeting on Friday, <laughs> get ready. Uh, we're very lucky that we've only got a small amount of penetration in these markets, so we have a long way to go. And I would definitely advise anyone who comes to the table, you can make Neil very happy when you get profitable. So like staying in your current markets and grinding out and getting more penetration seems to be the strategy of the day, it's certainly our strategy. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you so much for us being panelists. Um, hope you all enjoyed the conversation. We're going to now break. Um, we're going to have a 15-minute coffee break, uh, and then we'll all reconvene back in this room. And I believe it will be, is it here, Megan, in this room? Yeah, so we'll all be just staying here and hanging out. <laughs>